But I am here to introduce the Glenn Show one more time with my good friend and colleague Bruce Western, professor of sociology at Harvard University and a student of uh, social policy and of social inequality. And uh, we're going to have a conversation. And there's something special about this setting, as you can see. Rather than a split screen, we are in the same frame because we are in each other's presence. And not only that, we are replicating what we have been doing every Saturday that we're both in town at the same time, which is having a drink on a Saturday afternoon while we discuss the affairs of, uh, the affairs of state. <laughs> so we're happy to be able to share this conversation with our blogging head audience. Bruce, uh, you want to say anything by way of introducing yourself? Oh, it's, it, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, these conversations we have on uh, Saturday afternoon, I completely treasure them and, oh. uh, and I, I think this is uh, a wonderful experiment. In, it is uh, <laughs> it's an experiment, <laughs> but I do too, I agree. I mean, it's something I look forward to every week and miss when it doesn't happen and there's something, you know, soulful and humane about the whole thing. Yeah, and, I agree. Uh, intellectually stimulating. Something. Yeah, I, I agree. And okay. of course, uh, like our um, uh, afternoons uh, at the pub where we do our intellectual work on Saturdays. Uh, we've also got a few drinks here. Indeed we because do. Because that seems to be uh, an important part of our process. Uh, well, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so cheers. Cheers. Hey, you guys out there in Blogging Heads land, you remember the beer summit with President Obama <laughs> and Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. and Officer Crowley, <laughs> Vice President Biden? We got them beat because we're actually talking about something here. <laughs> Ironically, what we are talking about here today is crime, punishment, social policy, and inequality. And Bruce has literally written the book on the subject, his book, uh, Punishment and Inequality in America. Uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago has been one of the cornerstone texts and what has developed into a very serious reassessment of the direction that we've gone on prisons. And um, Bruce, I, I want, there's so many different things that we can talk about, but I want you to be doing some talking about both this big general question of uh, the role of prisons, punishment, policing, crime, law enforcement, public safety, and all of that in producing, reproducing inequality in our society. Um, and also, more specifically, about some of the things that you've been doing, because you've been interviewing people coming out of prison at close quarter and following them and have many interesting things to say about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, this is a, uh, a massive and a, it's a historic topic. Uh, I think we're, you know, we've done something in, incredible in this country. We've gone down a path that no other country... Uh, has gone down and we started to go down that path uh, uh, at a very important point uh, in the history of American race relations and uh, in the history of the nation. We built this massive uh, system of confinement uh, ostensibly to improve public safety but in doing so, uh, we made these incredible choices. We decided that we would uh, lock up 2.3 million people. Uh, we decided that we would make going to prison something normal for the young men uh, who lived in the poor communities that, uh, uh, that filled the prisons. And... Uh, and as a, as a purely social scientific matter, that strikes me as a hell of a puzzle, right? That we... Uh, Why it is that we did... We went down this road, right, and, uh, and no one else did, and we did it uh, at a very special time in the, uh, in the country's history. So let me see if I'm following you. We did it beginning in the early 1970s after a peaking of what had been... A rise in crime rates through the 1960s and we did it in part in reaction to that rise in crime rates. We did it also at a point in time right after the uh, peak of the civil rights movement influence at a time of transformation in terms of the status of African Americans in the society. We did it at a time of 
the beginnings of deindustrialization and the decline of the old scale big union uh, manufacturing base in the country. I'm not exactly sure what it was about the time that we did it that you think is especially salient. I and think the, uh, uh, the civil rights movement, I, I think uh, incarceration rates began to grow uh, in uh, 1973. I think we can pinpoint the year and uh, 68, uh, I guess, was yeah. uh, a year of uh, profound crisis, uh, political activism, yeah. uh, not just for this country, uh, but in Western Europe. Yeah, it was one of those years, 1968, 1848, I mean, it was one of those years. Exactly. Uh, it was a year of revolution, right? 1848, so a great comparison. And um, and then, and, and already by 68, you know, we were putting in motion uh, a, a reaction, uh, I think, to all that was going on. And as you say, uh, rising crime was part of this story. But, you know, if you look at the whole canvas of all of the social changes that were going on in America, really only a small part of the story. The rise and of crime is only a small part of the story. Yeah, yeah, I would say. And, um, and so there was you know, Vietnam, there was feminism. Uh, there was civil rights advocacy. There was the assassination of the, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the great and, liberal uh, leadership. Of, RFK. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, there was uh, urban unrest. Uh, uh, big time urban unrest. So what's the connect in your mind between these big uh, tectonic plate shifts that were going on in American political culture and the... Um, rise and the sharp uh, rise that you can detect right in 1973 and thereafter in the scale of imprisonment. Yeah, so I think we, we sort of, we, we often paint this story out in in small details and you know we, we talk about uh, this presidential campaign and, and this piece of legislation and this change in sentencing and so on, but if you sort of step back from uh, uh, the micro narrative of uh, the specific decisions that caused the penal population to grow, I think it must have felt, and you can tell me because you were there. Uh, <laughs> I it, was there. <laughs> it, it, it must great have felt. Beard, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not so great. That must have felt that the world was upside down, and. Uh, well, it felt like everything was up for grabs. Yeah. It did feel like that. And that must have been pretty discomforting and uh, an incredible source of anxiety uh, for people in power. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, and for the citizenry at large, at least uh, yeah. those who were not insulated by wealth or uh, whatever from all the chaos. Oh, I think so, right. I mean, uh, you, yeah. uh, 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 you look at a novel like um, uh, uh, American Pastoral, uh, American Pastoral by yeah. uh, uh, Philip Roth. Yeah. And um, he, he, he tells his story about how the riots in the city of Newark. Uh, the, the, the main character uh, is this guy uh, owns a glove factory, makes gloves, uh, a white guy, uh, a Jewish guy living in uh, Newark and the in entire city is uh, torn apart by this and all of the white working class uh, neighbourhoods of uh, uh, Newark, uh, uh, yeah. com completely roiled, right, and they empty out, and and and, and the ghettos left uh, uh, left behind. So I think sort of white working class Americans had a, a, a particular relationship to the um, complete social upheaval. Now this kind of transition has been chronicled by people. I think of the sociologist Jonathan Reeder's book Canarsie, the Jews and Italians of Brooklyn against liberalism. 
for one, but I mean, there will have been others. Uh, and it was a particular period in time, but you recall, I think, in a meeting that both you and I were present at recently, some well-informed historian saying that those kinds of period pieces were not the big canvas historical assessment, and uh, maybe they overemphasized the role of this white reaction relative to some other stuff, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, the historians say, the story is unbelievably complex, it, uh, yeah. it seems to me, or not, not just the historians, I think of uh, uh, Marie Gottschalk's uh, work in which, uh, in her yeah. account of the growth of prison population, there are all sorts of strange bedfellows, mothers strange against drunk driving, mothers so. against drunk yeah. driving, the, uh, 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 the, the women's movements, uh, uh, concern about domestic violence and uh, how that should be uh, cracked down on. They find themselves in bed with the tough on crime movement, and right. uh, and so there are so a lot of passengers on the train. Yeah. Yeah, but um, something about this time, okay, so the late 60s, the early 70s, okay, so social disorder changed, people are uncomfortable, so there's a seeming feeling that things are falling apart, so they turn to law and order and the security of an emphasis on safety and public safety as a response to that. But what of the intellectuals? I mean, what of the people like us who were living in those period, uh, those years, who were writing about what was happening? and advising policymakers about what was happening. I mean, um, this was the birth of neoconservatism in these years, right? Liberals who got mugged by reality and decided that, you know, if the city was going to work, somebody had to police those streets and, uh, you know, yeah. affirmative action wasn't such a good idea and, you know, perfectibility of man was an ideal that was uh, short of what we were capable of realizing. Right, right. I mean, so I mean, so so these guys are not uh, living in a social vacuum, and uh, and they're getting pretty anxious too. I think. Our right? intellectuals, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. And, and people so, who held chairs at uh, sociology and political science at places like Harvard, for example. Yes, and uh, perhaps even in the policy school there. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and 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 so. It's interesting, right? So they could have been formed by those times in a lot of different ways. That's and what I'm getting at. You say other countries did not respond to upheaval with the same degree of punitiveness as the United States did. That's right. And what is it about our culture, our history, our politics and social organization that accounts for that? And so we're talking now about how the intellectuals responded. Yeah. And they had choices. I think they did, right. And that they had models. They didn't even just have choices. They had models. They could see that things were playing out uh, somewhat differently in France and Italy and, uh, uh, and even, in, uh, even in the UK. And maybe... I don't know, so I'm, I'm sort of winging it here. No, certainly this isn't anything that I've written about, yeah. but this is very much in the spirit of our <laughs> Sunday Indeed, afternoon conversation. This is how good writing begins. <laughs> <laughs> but, so here is a country, right, the US, uh, in which Werner Zombard has asked, why no socialism in the United States? Maybe in the absence uh, of uh, a real left-wing politics, uh, uh, the door is open wider for conservative reaction and even formerly uh, liberal uh, intellectuals are um, you know, inclined to more authoritarian responses because that's what we got, right? That's uh, ultimately what we're talking about. Um, there isn't uh, uh, an organised social movement that's uh, speaking up for the underdog. I mean, the, the, the labor movement has been declining for years and years and years, and it's politically split anyway. And, and you could argue it's not clear it ever really spoke for the underdog, at least not in a broadly inclusive sense, but I won't. I won't. Yeah, I think, I, I think you could argue that convincingly. But, I mean, why isn't race the answer to the question? 
why isn't it both on both the side of the lack of a pro uh, progressive agenda because the coalition doesn't get formed and also on the side of a, a kind of less than a solidaristic you know politics and a kind of indifference or diffidence in the face of great inequality lack of sympathy because uh, people are not as quick to identify with uh, with uh, people who are not in the same yeah. box, or even more a more granular kind mm -hmm. of account might be something like, well, when you tried to construct a welfare state in the 1930s, the Southern segregationists were chairs of important congressional committees, and they said, no, if you wanted a labor movement that was really going to be muscular, it would have had implications for political power in certain regions of the country where blacks were large. Uh, part of the uh, labor force, yeah. which the powers in those regions of the country who had a veto uh, wouldn't abide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah. And, and, why isn't, the, I mean, it's obvious that America differs in terms of race because we had racial slavery and we had this large population of people who descended from the slaves, so that makes us different from France and Germany and the Netherlands and all of that. I don't know. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, this, I mean, this came up uh, in uh, uh, in our meeting uh, in Washington last week, right? The sort of the question on the table was, um, uh, where's the empathy? Somehow, the political sentiment that uh, drove mass incarceration uh, is devoid of empathy. There's no social solidarity that's somehow holding the society together uh, that sees uh, whites and African Americans as uh, yeah. the same people in the same society. Yeah. And um, is it just uh, is it just race? I mean, now, so my inclination now is to sort of get into the weeds of the data and. I think, uh, you know, race casts uh, such a long shadow over this problem, but it's not the whole thing, right? And uh, uh, I think, you know, the other part of it yeah. is, uh, uh, is poverty. And uh, yeah. it's not all African Americans. Yeah, you know, incarceration rates uh, didn't in, increase uh, extraordinarily among college-educated African Americans. Yeah. Uh, They're still they, higher, I assume, than college-educated whites, but not so much higher as is for the lower class. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, m nearly nearly all of the growth in incarceration rates uh, since 1980 has been concentrated among people, blacks and whites, uh, with uh, less than a college education. And so it, there's, it's overlaid, uh, it, it's overlaid by class, I think. That's inescapable. So then you must have been um, disquieted by, I mentioned the beer summit when we started this conversation, and I mentioned the arrest of Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr., your colleague <laughs> at Harvard University. You must have been disturbed, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, by the way in which the arrest of a um, wealthy global You're going to say something mischievous. I, I, I hope <laughs> you're going to say something mischievous. I'm just going and to uh, ask you. Yes. <laughs> Because yes, the cameras are turning and a press conference is being held, the President of the United States addresses himself to race, crime, and punishment and policing in this country. That's a rare event. You had to be paying attention when such a thing would happen. And that the story, the narrative would be, even a Harvard professor is not free from the racially motivated harassments of Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts police officers. <laughs> had to just drive you up the wall since you know that the real footprint of incarceration and punishment and the social inequalities associated therewith have to do with poverty, not with profiling. Poverty. <laughs> <laughs> not profiling. Not profiling. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's a bumper sticker <laughs> for every sociology major. <laughs> um, well, what do you say to that? 
my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's where I'm coming from. I, 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 I think that's inescapable. It, it's, in the, uh, it's in the data uh, uh, very strongly, and yet uh, very large racial disparities in the criminal justice system contact and we know of many many anecdotes uh, in which distinguished African Americans uh, have been treated unfairly by uh, uh, law enforcement. Indeed, I got some of those myself. Well, I don't doubt it, I don't doubt it and um, so what do we make of that? Are they so? I'm, am I diminishing them? I'm saying they're anecdotes. They're not what we see in the data. But uh, <coughs> poverty is not reducible to race. I don't want to punt. Uh, poverty uh, is not reducible to race. Race is not reducible to poverty. I mean, uh, poor whites, and there are many fewer of them. Uh, are also being locked up in greater numbers and uh, highly educated African Americans are at greater risk of contact with the criminal justice system, much higher risk than highly educated whites. Profiling happens, that is sure. clear, there's clear evidence of that. I guess you're asking, or tell me if this is what you're asking, what, what sort of first order, you know, what's the first order problem, which, uh, what kind of inequality uh, should we care about most? Is, is, what kind of inequality is, is, is largest? I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not so much asking for a comparison of which is bigger, or more important, or more significant, first, second as what's the narrative as I am asking what is the narrative here and what is the role that race plays in that narrative so a narrative that is exclusively racial that someone can only see these issues in terms of discrimination or some kind of racial bias or stereotyping or profiling or whatever misses on your account on a compelling account to my mind uh, the deep structure of the problems, which have to do with poverty, exclusion, the lack of access to resource, human development, uh, marginality, stigma, and things of this kind, which attend people's social location, which can interact with their race, but is not defined by it. I accept that completely. <clears throat> On the other hand, at the back of my mind, I harbor the thought that this shit would have never been allowed to get as bad as it is if it uh, hadn't it been represented as a response to the racial threat or if the bulk of the people who were suffering from the depredations of the system hadn't been black and you could have written them off or if it hadn't interacted in some way with a racial bias in the you know sort of who people identified with when they were prepared to call a halt to stuff I mean the historians mm -hmm. partly pers uh, persuade me of this so Khalil Gibran Muhammad persuades me of this when he says you know, when you look at what happened in New York State back in the 1930s and the 1940s when they had mandatory minimums and they started sending a lot of white guys away for three strike stuff that didn't seem to make any sense, you know, kid being locked away for 40 years because of, you know, three things he did when he was a, a hooker running around in, uh, you know, on Lower East Side. Yeah, they pulled back. They pulled back. They pulled back and they didn't pull back here. So there's the, that kind of role that race might play in it. And then I also think well, okay, poverty, but poverty and poverty, right? So there's a core concentrated inner city urban poverty, which might be different from other kinds of poverty in terms of the likelihood that you end up in a gang or that you end up running around, you know, uh, uh, perpetrating or being a victim of homicide or something like that. And then I think the social geography of our cities is partly defined by race as it's worked itself out over the centuries. So race would be implicated at another level and just the kind of background... Poverty has a landscape, and that landscape is racialized, this kind of idea. So let me ask you this, then. Um, what is race in this context? What is race? What is race? What do we mean by race? We, right, because 
uh, you know, the argument is out there, and um, uh, uh, you know, you uh, you live in East Boston, yeah, uh, right. which is uh, sort of uh, one of the few pockets yeah. of white poverty uh, yeah. uh, left in urban America. You live in East Boston. Yeah. Uh, you're a heroin addict. Yeah. Uh, you're on food stamps. You're right. trying to apply for SSI. Right. Um, you know, people. You know, you're tangled up in the criminal justice system. There's domestic violence in your family. There's Everybody's an alcoholic. You, right. And you, 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 you're mired in shit. And uh, uh, people say, you know. The stigma of entanglement in the criminal justice system, you know, it makes you black, right? And we look at, yeah. you know, I, I, I look at the people living in those communities who are acutely poor and struggling with all of what that implies, and they look very similar to me to the people who were living in Roxbury who were struggling with all of this. that implies. Do they say of themselves that it makes them black? No, some pointy-headed uh, graduate student I uh, when I go out and give... Uh, so they're virtually or, black. <laughs> they're virtually black. I mean, it's right. an intellectual construct. Not black, black is not the category. color. Right, black is not the color of your skin. It's a yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a social experience. I don't know. I mean, it's it's, it, 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 it's not baseless, right? There's no, it's not. There, there's something there. It's not black does not reference uh, black does not reference a. a, a Skin color, right? And does not reference only skin color. It's uh, referencing a culture, a history, a social experience, and what if other people yeah. occupy that You're, same you know, history? You culture? and I both like this film, Pulp Fiction. So when the gangster uh, Marcellus in the film is talking to the fighter, uh, the Bruce Willis character in the film about throwing the fight. Yeah. And at the end of the negotiation about the money going over, and Bruce Willis is supposed to go down, you know, in the seventh or the ninth or whatever the round is, he says. My nigga, right? You're my nigga, right? You know, you're my nigga, right? <laughs> so he makes a racial reference. We all understand what it means. It means, you know, you're my boy, you my, you know, I mean, I got you under my thumb. I mean, you know, I'm in control here. You're the nigga in this situation, right? And that's a racial reference, but it's to a white guy about a social position, not it's about a, the color it, of right, skin. It, it describes a social relationship. <laughs> so I get that. But let me respond to you. You say, what is race? So, um, you know, I've tried to write about this subject over the years. I understand that you have. I think... Uh, that the key issue is about you have marks on people's bodies that then take on social significance and that's really somehow at a deeper level what we must mean at the end of the day when we talk about race so for example let me just give an example take the Roma in Europe because there have been reports recently on national public radio about the employees at the Louvre uh, going on strike I don't know if you saw this so employees at the museum in Paris the Louvre going on strike because uh, they feel their physical safety is impaired by uh, the uh, apparently the gangs of thieves, pickpockets and whatnot. Children. And these are children, exactly. Yeah, they and they swarm and they confuse and they touch you and whatnot. And the next thing you know, your wallet or your purse is gone and they've run off. And the employees at the Louvre are saying, we won't come to work because the authorities, the larger authorities are not keeping the workplace safe enough, they're complaining. And in the report on national public radio, it is said, and it's reported that most of the uh, offenders are Roma. Okay, and I was stunned by the fact that they said that uh, because it struck yeah. me as like politically incorrect. You know, it's like you should be cautious. You wouldn't want to stereotype or whatever. So they must have been. And what the the race of the suspect uh, on the police blotter in uh, an American newspaper, right? Right. You shouldn't. I mean, it would be uh, gratuitous. Yeah. You know. But I'm, I'm just saying, so are the Roma a race? Okay, this is kind of where I'm going with this. I mean, is there a racial dimension to that? Okay, so there's a physical thing, and there's a kind of social closure on the networks of uh, kinship and whatnot like that. Or a linguistic community. Uh, they're a linguistic community. Uh -huh, and they have a culture. Yeah. But then, I, I mean, I think the, the, 
the Roma are fundamentally defined by their relationship to the mainstream of European society, right? And uh, um, they're on the outs. Uh, they are, in the European imagination, uh, people without nation, uh, without loyalties. Yeah, no, that's uh, so interesting. Uh, no yeah. national affiliation. They're wanderers. They're travelers. Yeah, that's right. And uh, us, uh, they, how could they be us? Right? Yeah, they, they can't be us. They can't be us. We're we're French. We're German. We're Italian. And uh, uh, how could how could the Roma be? We're Hungarian. So there's a kind of institutionalized outsiderness. I mean, almost they exist in virtue of being outsiders. That's that's what defines them. Yeah, so I'm hesitating yeah. because they're different. Culture. And, uh, they really, yeah, you mean to say they really are different? I think they are, right? I mean, they, uh, they have kids at 14. They, uh, uh, they're not open to... Uh, European society. It's very difficult to, uh, if you're Euro European, it's very difficult to become accepted by Roma society. Uh, You're not blaming the victim here, are you? This is tough, right? So this, uh, yeah. to circle back to our um, yeah. American conversation. Yeah, and, um, and, and to advance to our shot with our beer. Hey, I've been jumping into my shot. Oh, I you see. Should, you, should, you should definitely Cheers. advance. Cheers. Cheers. Right. I think we're going to go to a whole new level now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you were just saying. But, uh, right, so, right, is it. So, where we started this was like, what is race? Right. You know. And uh, the opening pre premise, your opening premise was, uh, it's a mark on the body. You know, it could be a tattoo. A physical yeah. distinctiveness that then gets a social meaning imputed to it. Right. Uh, but there's a lot of endogeneity in this road. What if... Uh, the insiders won't live with you, so you live uh, as an outsider community. Yeah. Uh, you're segregated. Yeah. Uh, you don't have access to the open labour market uh, in the way. So you have to uh, cultivate ways of making a living that are not legitimate. You're all in the underground economy. Right. And uh, and your social exclusion. As the continental say, makes your physical difference uh, even more meaning. A social reality, a social reality. You are living a different kind of life. You know, if I mean, I don't want to. It's hard. I'm saying I don't want to trade in stereotypes here, but. You know, at some level, this is what we social scientists do, right? We uh, we, we make, call them generalizations. We call them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well-founded empirical generalizations. <laughs> that's right. On the basis of systematic observation. Indeed. <laughs> we should put that so, as uh, one key, and that's what comes out in your paper. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm probably on on safer ground talking about American society than the Roma experience in uh, in Hungary or something. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, so we know uh, uh, we know what poverty looks like. We know what African American uh, poverty looks like, um, and it's very different from uh, uh, the mainstream of American society. Much greater risk of violent victimization. I want to talk about violence. Can we do that? I mean, um, I was showing my students some data not long ago, just about uh, murder rates by age and race. Okay, yeah. victim and perpetrator. Yeah. It was a two by two. 
We had, because uh, uh, murder, you know, they find the victim all the time because yeah. the body doesn't disappear and they find the perpetrator most of the time because, you know, it's hard to get away with killing somebody. And so they know the race and the age of the perpetrators and the victims for all these murders. And it turned out like a huge, because a big chunk of the murders of Americans are murders of young black men perpetrated by young black men. I mean, it's very striking. 16 to 24, right? Yeah, 16 to 24. exactly. In that very young cohort. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, both as perpetrators and as victims of yeah. these uh, of these terrible events, and I'm just sort of saying. So, what does one make of that? What is the, you know, sociological account of that? And what are the implications, uh, normatively, that come out of that? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, for example, you could argue keeping people safe would be a first order priority, and if that, there's a certain vocation by class and race or whatever, then which I think this threat to public safety is greatest, that should be the place that gets most of the attention in terms of uh, interdiction and law enforcement. Someone who says, if I can catch one out of a hundred guns, I can prevent one in a twenty murders or something like that. If I can just, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if I can have a, you know, stop and frisk technique or something that, you know, I mean, it inconveniences a lot of people, but, uh, you know, there's a good chance I'm going to find a gun if somebody's carrying a gun. And if he doesn't have the gun, he can't commit the crime. And if the crimes are being committed upstairs, up uh, town in Harlem, that's where I want to be looking for the guns. And you got a whole different kind of argument. So anyway, I'm asking many different yeah. things at one time: yeah. violence, race, concentration of it in a certain social location. What are the implications for that? How do you respond to it? How do we think? How do we want to think about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is sort of the the nub of it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I if I think too hard about these uh, the socioeconomic gradient in homicide, uh, just it it makes me very sad. Um, the you know, the, the people have to, that that's the social reality that people have to contend with. Um, but but then, what, then what are you going to, what are you going to do about that problem, right? That's a, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy that, uh, that these poor communities, that these young African American men, 16 to 24, have these incredible homicide rates, and and these are the poorest communities, and those kids have the lousiest opportunities. And on any given day, right? Let's be clear: on 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 any given day, they could be on either side of that gun, right? They could yeah. be a victim or they could be a, an offender. Right. On any given day. And is that the place in which we want to pile on punishment, right? That's our cho- That's the choice we've made. We've decided that for that social problem, we're going to pile on punishment. We're going to spend $70 billion a year on that. And we could have spent those, that $70 billion in so many different ways. And that's what, that's what we've chosen for those kids I don't know, I mean... So how about this? On any given day, any one of those kids could be on either side of the gun. So either they're all victims, or they're all people who could have been on the offending side of the gun, so they're all potential perpetrators. And if we view them as potential perpetrators, as people who on any given day might be on the wrong side of a gun, we come down hard on them. And the fact that their prospective victimization doesn't figure much in our thinking. But if we think of the kid that's on the offending side of the gun as himself in some sense a victim having been locked into a system of social interaction that inclines him or, you know, militates in that direction, um, then, then our response would be much more um, forgiving uh, to this. The way, I mean, I think there's kind of a, there's a... Uh, is a sociological opportunity in this discussion, right? Because if on any given day you could be on either side of the gun, what's violent is not the person, but the situation, 
right? And so, as an intervention, we should be focused on reducing violent situations rather than uh, reducing the numbers of violent people. Can I interrupt for a minute with a quantitative sociologist objection? Because you're assuming that anybody placed in the situation would behave in the same way, when in fact, it may be that only certain kind of people would have been in the situation in the first place, and those are the same kind of people would have been inclined to behave in this way. I think the problem is... So to say that the violence of an act is in the situation is to presuppose that pretty much any person placed in that situation would be inclined toward the violent act, but people get into situations based on who they are. So this is... Uh, in part. This is the segue... Uh, <laughs> To the normative debate. This is exactly the issue in the normative debate, right? Because um, I think I can't say with confidence uh, if I grew up in that neighbourhood yeah. and uh, uh, with those parents and that school and those opportunities. Yeah that I would not be in that situation. I can't say that about myself. Right. Neither um, can I. And that inclines us to a certain normative perspective, right? And and so I guess, I, I, I guess others among us, uh, your uh, neoliberal uh, policy intellectuals, who we're not naming today. <laughs> but we stay ready to name them on some future discussion. <laughs> and, and, and they may well have been named in the past. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, so that, I, they, they may make a different assessment. So, so here's an interesting thing. What gives? What explains that variation, right? I mean, because I don't... I, so I don't... How, how could, where would your head be at? that you could think, oh yeah, I, I, um, uh, I have such uh, strength of character that... I would never know, succumb to the temptations of joining I, a drug gang. Uh, or, I, uh, I, was, I, I was so born with that, uh, that uh, you know, defects of character and so on explain the, uh, the failings of these people. Maybe this is too easy, but I sometimes think that if people spent more time with and had more of a direct knowledge about the character of the lives of people trapped in poverty, they will be less quick to assume that those people trapped in poverty are simply reaping what they had sown and more able to see that if they had been born with a sexually abusive father or been abandoned by an alcoholic mother or beaten by uh, the uh, neighbor's uh, older uh, child's son or whatever it was mm -hmm. or whatever, that they too might have found themselves into this, uh, you know, in, in this uh, situation. I, you know, so it's like maybe one uh, aspect of a general movement to try to change things would be to just acquaint people with the character of these lives, you know. That's what I get out of reading ethnography, for example. Yeah. You know, I read the yeah. descriptions at close quarters of the nature of people's interactions, their lives, their hopes and dreams and thoughts that they're prepared to share with an investigator. And I think, yeah. oh my God, these poor people, you know, they're not getting enough to eat. They're not, you know, they're confused. They're, they're on fraught. They're on the, you know, they've got all these different things. Well, imagine trying to live that. Imagine trying to raise kids, taking them up to visit the father in the prison or whatever it is. Or imagine... How, what it is to be a hustler. Imagine not being secure in your person. I mean, imagine it. Yeah. You know, not knowing whether or not somebody's going to violate you. Always having yeah. to be prepared to fight. Yeah. That's that's got to be real. And that's kind of hard in you. That's got to you know. So, so we got to know this. I I take two things from this. One is right. You you know you're gonna we, we there's a uh, there's a hidden world uh, of. Uh, uh, acute poverty and uh, uh, and social hardship that uh, we don't really know, and we got to right uh, here in America, right here in Boston, Massachusetts, and the Greater uh, Boston, right, and right. all around this great country. And and so like my, you know Michael Harrington, this was the great revelation uh, of Michael Harrington. He was pulling back a curtain on a world that we yeah. uh, that we didn't know, but you know what? It's still there, and so we have to remain familiar and familiarize ourselves with it, and this is one of the great 
contribution to the social sciences. So, point one. Point two. People sound off on the character and uh, the, the, the quality of the decisions made by people in those communities all the time and they don't know anything about those communities. They don't know anything about the reality of uh, the crushing character of, uh, uh, of acute poverty. And, and what's worse is that they don't exhibit any curiosity about that. And they're very happy to impose their own social position uh, and all of the biases and moral judgments that accompany that uh, when they assess uh, the decisions uh, of the people that live in those communities. And I think just as a basic matter of social science, as a basic matter of policy analysis, if you're going to hold yourself out as a policy analyst and you have theories about how people act in those communities, you need to observe those communities, that would seem to be really elementary. And uh, I think we have not done this right. I mean, this is like a, a, a profound failure of the tough on crime movement. It has never come to grips with the lived reality of uh, social life in very poor communities. And uh, um, I, mean, I mean, this is... And... and you know, this sort of lurks in the background it's a puzzle. I don't fully understand it and don't have a, a well formulated answer. Um, but it seems to be curious, right, about the lives in those communities. Uh, that's the seed of empathy, right? The, we ourselves could be. Uh, in that position, if we were in that position, we could make similar decisions and so on. This incuriosity about how people are actually living their lives and what they have to contend with. So let me let me push back a little bit, Bruce. Sure. I mean, I actually I, I agree with you so much here, but I, it's my job to push back. <laughs> so in the um, history discipline, uh, there's this controversy, as I understand it between Mandarin historians who look at the um, papers that are left by bureaucrats and politicians and mm -hmm. study the great actors of uh, sweeping impact, and history from below types who look at the lives of ordinary people and whatever. And so there's a debate about how should history be done. History is storytelling about the past, it's the creation of narrative, and if the voice is only that of the powerful, then the perspective only from those who have been movers and shakers, then much will be missed about resistance from below and other perspectives and so on. So that's history. But social analysis presumably is about cause and effect, consequence of if I take this action then this will be the result. And program design and evaluation and implementation and modification are presumably a technical enterprise of that sort. What works and what doesn't, what's the evidence for it, this and that. It's not necessarily narrative construction, is it? And voices are less important than, I don't know, data and you know, double-blind uh, demonstration of the causal effect of this or that. So there's something sentimental about this idea that I need to go out and talk to a welfare mother in order to know whether or not giving her an apartment and a stipend on a monthly basis is an encouragement to her to have children out of one the data can resolve that one for me, and they have. And the policy implications of those data don't require me to interview her. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> <to that>. yeah. <laughs> I'm just pushing back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. That's the, the few different ways to think about that question, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think I think you're right in the sense that 
we need to observe things systematically and unsentimentally. Uh, see the social world for what it is. I'm not sure the policy analysts are doing that, uh, incidentally. Uh, but we definitely have to do that. Uh, I think... I think people, you know, they want to be... People want to be righteous in the world, right? Yeah. And they want to be able to view their actions as honourable and meaningful, right? Yeah. And so, if people appear not to be doing that, then we need to figure out the context in which they're in uh, that makes what they do uh, appear honourable and meaningful. I think that's a really fundamental sociological problem. And I think it's... it's Let me it's, just make sure I understand the problem. Yeah. How is it that people at the margins of society who are operating with one foot this side of that of laws of lines of decency come to be able to construct their self-understandings in an honorable way. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that if we want to know what's going on around us. Yeah, and it may, so we may learn, right, if we, uh, if we do our serious empirical observation, we may learn, for instance, uh, that police and the criminal justice system are not legitimate, for instance. Uh, yeah. We... Uh, we may learn that they are viewed as adversaries uh, rather than institutions that uh, help maintain order uh, in, uh, in a righteous way. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the, the policy technicians have never really seriously considered uh, the problem of legitimacy which is which is really fundamental right so much of how we think people respond uh, to punishment arrest criminal justice contact mm -hmm. turns on a normative assumption that the actions of police and the courts and prosecutors are, are righteous, right, are legitimate. But what if you are living in a community and you feel surveilled and policed and singled out and, uh, and not just you as an individual uh, who's transgressing the law, but somehow your entire community uh, has been chosen for this special and punitive treatment. And then I think you know, the whole equilibrium that we imagine as policy analysts doesn't really exist because there's a whole uh, set of norms that are, that are operating that are different from those that we assume. And, but, uh, but to find that out, you've got to go into those communities and you've got to talk to people and you have to come to grips with the texture of everyday life and you have to be very, very sceptical, I think, about your own pr presumptions about what's right and wrong and, uh, you know, what does a good father do? What does a good mother do? What does, you know... So, it seems to me this is a, a fundamental point, Bruce, because we're talking about social control, conformity to expectations about normative behavior and so on. And what we know is that where that is achieved as a sociological outcome, it is not mainly a response to externally imposed constraints, incentives, and limitations on people, mm. but rather an expression of internally embraced mm. ideas about how to live. That's a great point. Okay? What keeps society stable, what keeps the, uh, the magna from just kind of blowing up into some kind of nonsense, is that people cooperate with each other willingly, not because they're coerced to do so. Yeah. So, if 
the instruments of coercion have the effect of alienating people from a sense of involvement with and ownership with the social achievement of order causes them to see themselves as alien, outsider, um, uh, not my system, not my rules, not for me, it will have been counterproductive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a great point. I'm smiling because <laughs> I'm, 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 thinking, I'm thinking of Margaret Thatcher. Ah, and, uh, Baroness Thatcher. Baroness Thatcher. Uh, I'm the late, great Baroness Thatcher. The, the, the light Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> go on. Who, who said famously, society does not exist. And yet, Aha. transparently that okay. can't be true. Right? The social order is, oh, yeah, I see. Is, is underpinned by an understanding of who we are and what we belong to. And if we don't feel that we belong to something, then uh, that's an enormous source of stress uh, to the social order. And I'm, I'm of a mood at this point in the discussion to name names. Okay. And, uh, because my, uh, my graduate student reading group, uh, my uh, uh, Justice and Inequality reading group, Yes. Uh, uh, talked about Mark Kleinman's book on uh, uh, when brute when force fails. When brute force Boston University Press, two thousand and ten, if I recall. That is, uh, I think that is the correct. Uh, <laughs> when brute the force fails. Mark Kleinman, professor of public policy at UCLA, and sometimes guest on the Glenn Show. And we love Mark. And we love Mark. He's our <laughs> buddy, <laughs> our professor at the Kennedy School of Government, where Bruce is employed, amongst other places. <laughs> And a former colleague of mine from years past. Okay, so you're thinking about his book and your students are responding to his book. Right. And, and, and so I think the big, the big challenge uh, for Mark, and, you, you know, Mark is grappling with a real problem. He's saying, how can, we, how can we reduce crime with less punishment? That's what he's saying. That's the fundamental question that Mark is asking. After Machiavelli. Mark understands himself to be laboring in the same vineyard as the great Italian Oof. theorist. <laughs> some big shoes to fill. And, uh, but if anyone can fill them, I don't know. Okay, anyway, and, uh, so, so less crime, less uh, punishment. Uh, uh, less crime, less punishment. That's, uh, that's what he's going for. Right. But, and the solution uh, involves... Uh, reducing the severity of punishment, uh, but greatly in increasing the footprint uh, of, the of the system with close monitoring, small but immediate right. sanctions to people who deviate. Because if people are monitored, yeah, they'll uh, they'll fly right. That's the theory. Yeah, that's the in, theory. In a nutshell, <coughs> Project Hope. Project Hope. Uh, <laughs> and so so the question our discussion raises if the footprint is greatly enlarged what will be the implications of that uh, for the legitimacy uh, of the system in the community as a whole and I think uh, you know that's a that's a really, that's a really fundamental, uh, a really fundamental question. Let me just explain to people. Yeah. People should understand that uh, Mark in his book argues, for example, that if you could put an ankle bracelet on somebody, you might not have to incarcerate them. If you could get them to really not use the drug by monitoring them closely and frequently with testing and so forth, you could get them to stop using it, and the drug use was a part of what caused them to criminal offend. So that if you're at close quarters with the person in terms of this monitoring and supervision, with modest punishments and rewards for good, bad, and good behavior, respectively, you could really reduce their offending without having to confine them. So you can have more public safety and less imprisonment. Although it involves a vast expansion of the interaction with people in terms of putting ankle bracelets on them or having them come in for systematic periodic review. 
Uh, so I just wanted to set the context for that. Yeah, I wonder if that's what's going on with stop and frisk, actually. And uh, I mean, such a puzzle, stop and frisk. In I thought it was about finding and, guns. Uh, I thought it was about increasing the likelihood that if you're carrying a concealed weapon illegitimately, you will be detained in, in a certain social location, uptown Manhattan or whatever. You will be detained. So on the one hand, we get those guns off the street, and on the other hand, we create fear in the hearts of people who might be thinking about carrying them. That's the theory. That's yeah. the theory. It's, it, it's so hard to work out what's happening in New York right now. And I think the legitimacy of the police in New York City uh, is really under acute stress. And uh, Is there any evidence of that? <laughs> I mean, I'm just asking. <laughs> that is the question. Do you know the work of Eshla Weaver and uh, this and Amy Lerner? Lerner um, Amy Lerner. Amy Lerner at Princeton. I yes. do. I do. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing. They're doing great work. What they say? I thought they said heavy-handed policing was causing people to have less investment in the system and diminishing the legitimacy of the system. Their papers. The conference uh, title was "Detaining Democracy." Detaining, demo Detaining democracy. We were both at that conference. Yeah, we were both. At that conference. <laughs> <laughs> you, and you the manuscript that had been a, yeah. a, a, a published book, I actually perused. Uh, and in my perusal, I noticed that that's what they were saying that there was evidence from interviewing people in New York City and such that, uh, you know, the heavy handed footprint of the stop and frisk system had caused people to have less confidence in the system. And the NYPD will say, Crimes at its lowest exactly. level since 1961. As indeed it is. It's a good question. Uh, it, 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 it appears to be, I don't know, I, you know, I want to, I, I want to put on the table, uh, the effect of CompStat and how we measure crime. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, Okay, so the data are a result of endogenous shifts in reporting. I, I, I think we don't fully understand that. I think there's enormous institutional pressure in big city getting police the forces down. and getting the numbers down. And, uh, and there are anecdotes about cooking the numbers yeah. uh, and stuff. Now, isn't that ironic because there uh, recently have been these, uh, Atlanta is the most recent case of teachers uh, yeah. caught cheating on the teacher exam. So the teacher exam is put in place to vet the teachers, I mean not the teacher exam, excuse me, the exam of achievement of the students yeah. who are being taught by the teachers are put in place so no child to chronicle behind. the effectiveness of the teachers. Right? No, no child, child left, left behind. behind requires that all the kids be tested. So now that the kids are going to be tested and that there are real consequences to the test results, teachers have been caught, accused allegedly of having tampered with the thing. Might police officers be capable of the same behavior within the context of bureaucratic circumstance? What I find ironic is that <laughs> the late, great James Q. Wilson, political scientist extraordinaire, to name names, to name names <laughs> and student of bureaucracy, Indeed. would have understood the point that bureaucratic imperative might dilute the informational effectiveness of monitoring systems. He would have understood that bureaucracies would have worked against. Like that, he would have understood. Would have worked against your measurement technique, and it would have been this thing like, "You think you're measuring? Well, hey, we we ain't finished playing with you yet. Okay, we get to write the stuff that you put into your database. Okay, so he would have understood that at a deep level. He would have understood that teacher cheating and police cheating are like different sides of the same coin. <laughs> And he would have, therefore, if he were honest intellectually, have had to treat with skepticism the police department reports that crime has plummeted and dropped like a like a stone wherever it is that they've doubled up on their uh, surveillance techniques. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if it's true or not. I, I think that's that's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's I, you know, but then <laughs> the, uh, the hardcore crime people will say with justification. You know, it's hard to gain murder statistics. That's true. They would say that. That's and, true. And you look at murder statistics. And they're down. And they're, they're way down. I think people... I mean, God, there's, you know, there's uh, more than 40,000 cops uh, on the street in New York now. It's 
it's a massive force that's increased enormously uh, that has to reduce murders and uh, other violence. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that, but that doesn't uh, dispose of the argument uh, that people are gaining the stats either. Let me ask you this. We've been talking for a while, and if anyone is still listening to us, God love you. <laughs> what, are we, what, what are we at? Where uh, time wise, can we? Can, can you we, see that? Um, I I uh, can't quite read it. It looks like one hour plus one wow. hour and five wow. minutes. I think it is. Mm. So I think we this should actually a, conclude. Bruce, I wanted to hear about this paradise. <laughs> I wanted to hear so much about how you're talking with people coming out of prison and what they're oh, saying to man. you, so we need to have another conversation. God, that's a revelation. I'd love to. We, we will. Okay. Very so, good. Very good. My friend? Oh, such a pleasure, Glenn. Yeah, really. As always, we got our Saturday drinking. I think we did. I think we